Hi there, uh, welcome back to the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. I had some uh, technical difficulties with the last time I tried to record. Uh, specifically, I uh, forgot to real. Uh, I didn't realize that my mic had been muted, so I recorded a whole episode with uh, no audio, <laughs> which isn't which isn't going to help me out, which is pretty bad, in fact. But uh, thankfully, you know, I I've been saving frequently enough, and in fact, I you know I, I had a save left where I had started this episode, well, the, the, the episode I tried to record, at, say, at this same point where I'm here, where I'm at right now, so thankfully it wasn't too much, it wasn't, wasn't any extra work to just, to get back to this point after, uh, you know, I had stopped recording for that, uh, day. But here we are, back, or here I am, back, uh, here, and so, so, up to a certain point, my reactions aren't gonna be, like, as blind as it was since I've already since I've already seen up to a certain point, you know, so that's unfortunate, but like I said, but I, I, I'm a dumb dumb. But anyway, uh, let's, let's uh, just keep going. Back with uh, Ashley Great on here. Now, I believe I had already pressed this statement before, so let's go to this one. Hold it! So you're saying that Mrs. Stray lifted the ticket from your pocket or bag? That's right. Despite being mindful of danger when walking in the insalubrious areas her kind frequent. Objection! Mr. Stray did no such thing! Well, of course you would take that stance. <laughs> the girl is a regular offender. You came to the pawnbrokery that day prepared with all the information you needed to identify the defendant. You were looking for her. That's what brought you to Wonderbanks. To get your hands on Mr. McGill's disc. Objection! Well, at least it wasn't something else that Mr. McGill did. My learned friend is a very veritable font of nonsense. D nonsense? I concur with the prosecution. Counsel, you will refrain from conjecturing in this way. Is that clear? Yes, my lord. Jeez. Then I will continue with my testimony for what possible use it can be. I, I mean, I, I am still gonna like press everything and stuff like I did last time, even though I know what's gonna happen. You know, I, I like to be thorough for the audience. <laughs> I proceeded at once to the shop in order to explain my situation and redeem my article. Okay. Had you ever been to Winterbanks before? Only once for the purposes of pawning something, but like many, I enjoy browsing in such establishments. So when you noticed that the pickpocket had taken your ticket, you chased after her. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. I didn't notice at first, of course. Such is the art of the pick purse. But when I did, I headed to the pawnbrokery at once in order to reclaim my coat before the thief could. I was merely trying to recover what was rightfully mine in the first place. Ah, he can say that what he likes because he knows that we have no evidence to contradict him, Anders. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we can't really prove, uh... Well, I mean, we can prove he was there, but we can't prove that he was, you know... The stuff about him following Gina... And, and like knowing it was her yeah, and stuff. But yeah, for whatever reason, we didn't hold on to that like note of his her description. Because if we had, we could just presented that, you know, back during the dance production thing. You know, when we got it, when, 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 if we if we had kept that evidence, you know. But alas, we did not. Hold it! In the end, of course, it just was taken by the police. Right, right. 
Yes, it was taken by Inspector Gregson here, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. This was the very man. Apparently, the police are collecting anything that has a connection to Mr. Right? Gilded as evidence. Hmm. Care to respond, Mr. Gray, Mr. Mr. Fucking Gregson? Excuse me. Is something wrong, Inspector? Um, well, um, uh, what do you mean? The last remark Mr. Graydon made in his testimony seemed to trouble you in some way. Eh? No. No, it didn't. It's nothing. Leave it alone. Let me ask you this, Inspector. Why is Scotland Yard gathering Mr. McGilder's possessions? I can't tell you something like that, Sunshine. Uh, what is it, Inspector? Investigative secrets? Uh, yes, exactly. You should know all about that. Magnus McGilded, who died so <laughs> unexpectedly after his trial two months ago. A man renowned throughout the capital for his great contributions to public life. Yet, he had a dark side too. Where you going with his fanseeks? I suppose the police are dealing with the aftermath of his nefarious activities, are they? Uh, that's enough! Coppers like me have duties to carry out that we're not liberty to talk about. It's all you need to know. Duties conferred by Lord Strongheart, I presume. <laughs> the Lord Chief Justice appears to have great faith in you, Inspector. <sighs> the bottom line is, if you want to get more out of me, you're going to need Lord Strongheart's paw print first. Well, that's a funny way of putting it. What's all this about? It's like there's something going on between Gregson and Lord Van Sykes here. Yeah, he's been very weird. I mean, Gregson, I mean. He's, he's acting a bit strange. There's that bit earlier. Uh, this now. It's, I mean, it's more like, it's, it's kind of like Greg Sus, you know? He's like, when the Greg is sus, am I right, fellas? <sighs> well, it would appear that the inspector has revealed all he has alone to reveal. Mr. Graydon, let us return to your testimony. Mm, gladly, my lord. <laughs> In other words, I had absolutely no reason to break into the little shop later that same night. Hold it! Is that so? Is that truly so? But perhaps you'd seen something of value among the forfeited items. No, <laughs> not at all. Oh. A value was brought in by the police to assess everything in the shop. Without exception, every article on the shelves was common or guarded bric-a-brac. In that case, it's clear that you broke into the shop later that day in order to recover Mr. McGilded's disc. Have you not been listening, man? Even if I had wanted to go recover the disc, you may recall that it had been seized by the police that afternoon. It was no more in that shop that night than I. As I keep saying, I simply had no reason to break in. So there was nothing of McGilded's left in the shop that night. Nothing this man might have been after. I wonder if that's really true. Ray, no, if you have some evidence, then let him have it. I'm dying to see that irritatingly assured expression of his crumble. McGilded slipped a disc into his coat pocket and had it deposited at Windowfix. Then, when he realized he was going to be arrested on suspicion of the omnibus murder, he threatened Gina and forced her to take the redemption ticket. Ah, there's no doubt about it. That witness is lying through his pearly white teeth. The police were obviously after anything left behind by McGilded as well. That's why Inspector Gregson ended up taking the disc into custody that day. Ah, but Gregson's being very strange about all this. There must be a reason for that, I'm sure. I just don't know what it is. For now, I need to focus on exposing the fact that Mr. Graydon is lying in his testimony. Yeah, it is all a bit, it is a bit strange, Greg, Gregson's behavior. But thankfully, I do know what I should present here. After all, he says he has no reason to break into the shop. But 
if we reconsider things, there was, of course, the gentleman's overcoat, but there was another article. One small box that was pawned by our boy McGilded. Objection! So let's uh, shove that in his face and see what he thinks about it. This disc was deposited at Winterbanks on Magnus McGilded's instructions. You knew that, and you went there with the intention of obtaining it for yourself. Objection! Conjecture again. And in any case, the disc was taken into custody by the police that afternoon. The witness had no reason to visit the pawnbrokery again that night. Objection! Sorry, my learned friend. That's not true. Yeah, fucking drag his ass, Ryanosuke. What? Mr. McGill that had another article in pawn at Winterbanks. As this second pawnbroker's ticket proves. Ah. There were two articles belonging to Mr. McGill that did Winterbanks pawnbrokery. And the reason you broke into the shop that night was to recover the second one. Together with your two accomplices, the Skulkin Brothers. Ah. Hmm. Ah, this is, this is the second ticket, is it? What had the man deposited? The article description reads, One small box. Ah, rather vague description, it seems to me. Are you suggesting that I broke into the pawnbrokery with these clowns in order to steal some trinket box? <laughs> Yeah, you guys just look away. It ain't got nothing to do with you, obviously. I believe that there are, that there are adequate grounds to suspect that you did. This is absurd! Why on earth would I do such a thing? Once the article has been forfeited, I could simply walk into the shop and purchase it. There would be absolutely no need for me to resort to theft. Hmm. That's a good point. Hmm, indeed. The witness makes a solid argument. So that means that for some reason, this great aunt fellow needed the small box that very night, does it? Objection! Yeah, what do you guys say now, bro? It's time to put an end to this nonsense, my lord. Could you be a little less cryptic, Lord Van Zeeks? I do hate to ruin my learned friend's argument. But the truth is quite incontrovertible. On the night in question, no small box was taken for Winterbank's pawnbrokery. And, rest assured, the prosecution can prove it. What? Ah, good gracious. Inspector, show the photographic prints to the court, if you please. Yes, sir. What prints? These prints were taken from one of the detective's security cameras. Ah! Heard these red-handed recorders again! As previously explained using the plan of the shop layout, the victim's establishment was furnished with automatic cameras in two locations. One was set to capture the counter where Mr. Winterbank received his customers, and the other was set to capture the shelves on which articles were placed for sale once forfeited. According to the information on this ticket, the gilded small box had been forfeited already. Two days before the incident, at 9pm on the 30th of April to be precise, which means it would have been on the shelves of forfeited items in the shop front. Now, what I have here is a print taken by one of the cameras about two hours before the incident. That's at 11pm on the 15th of April. Hmm, the victim certainly had a very full shop, it would appear. And then we here have another print. And this one was taken about two hours after the incident. I see. So we have two pictures to compare. Now I must say, the placing them side by side leaves me cold. Oh dear me, that's starting to make my head ache. Obviously, at Scotland Yard, we considered theft as one possible motive in this case. 
We explored the possibility that something had been taken in addition to the victim's life. So your men have already compared these two prints thoroughly, Inspector? Yes, sir. We counted every single item in each of these two photographic prints, you see. And your conclusion is that exactly the same number are present in both. In both. Hmm. In other words, nothing was taken for the pawnbrokery on the night in question. And my learned friend assertion is nothing more than a hopeful fantasy. Ah! F tiger sauce. I don't believe it. If I could have just shown that he'd stolen McGilda's pawn box. Ah, uh, there you go, dancing again. I might have been able to break him down at last. You know what, Runo? I've been thinking. I wonder if these two photographs really are exactly the same. What? So, Gato, in light of the evidence put forward by the prosecution, what is your position? It seems that, in fact, on the night in question, nothing was stolen from the victim's establishment. Do you accept the prosecution's assertion? I don't know. Could there be some hidden discrepancy in these two photographic prints somewhere? Well, thankfully, this is a, a difference that you can see without having to fucking cross your eyes or use a stereoscope. Because the discrepancy, though it is subtle, I noticed it pretty quickly the first time. I wasn't sure at first, but there is a clear discrepancy between these two prints. What? You must identify the location in question for the court, counsel. Indicate the precise location of the discrepancy of which you speak. Well, if you look hereabouts, you notice that this small box has been slightly moved. Just so it's still there, but uh, again, just move slightly to the right, it would appear. Now, I'm not sure why or to what end, but it, the discrepancy is there, Take so... That. Point that bad boy out. Granted, these two prints are almost identical. However, there is one minor discrepancy between them. What? 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 Mate? <laughs> when you two, when you view the two pictures stereoscopically, thankfully I just saw with my eyes. Yep, that's definitely a box. A single area stands out as being different. The location of this small box. Oh yeah, dumb Barack. Uh, using his stupid stereoscope. <laughs> too bad he doesn't cross his eyes so we can't see his dumb cross-eyed expression. Uh, let me... Wait. Un unbelievable! By Jove! You're bright! How extraordinary! What this tells us is very simple. Mr. McGilded's small box was indeed not stolen from Windebanks on the night in question. However, there can be no doubt that somebody picked up this particular box and then returned it to its place on the shelves. Are you suggesting that the small box originally deposited by Mr. McGilded is in fact... Yes, the very same small box I just identified in those photographic, photographic prints. Objection. Mindless guesswork! What if it was? So a box was moved on the shelf. Nothing was stolen. Which means quite simply that nothing has changed. That that may be true, but alright. So Miss Gilda's box wasn't stolen then. But doesn't the fact that it was moved like that change things? Uh yeah, I mean yeah, the fact that it was moved at all, it's like why would you move a random box if it didn't have some relation to what you were looking for or something? You know, maybe there's something inside the box, you know? I believe this changes everything about the case. How can that possibly be? 
The crucial point is the fact that what was moved was a small box. In other words, we have to consider what might have been inside that box. Yeah, exactly, Rinosuke. What are you suggesting? Uh... I'm suggesting that we need to examine that box as soon as possible. A vital piece of evidence is sitting on the shelves at Winterbanks as we speak. Objection! That won't be necessary. Some little box belonged to a man who died two months ago. That can't possibly be relevant to this trial. <sighs> the court does not afford your objection, Lord Van Zeeks. Bailiff, arrange for an officer to go to Baker Street at once. Obtain the small box in question and bring it back here for further examination. Yeah, it's, it's time to go looking in some boxes. <laughs> yeah, that's Rianosuke's face. That's Brock's face. Nice, uh, cr nice cravat, by the way. And there's Ashley's face. Looking rather cross, if I uh, must say. Hmm, we should have a report within half an hour. I think perhaps we should whiz us for a short while until the evidence is brought forth. For one, I've been craving a turn on the monkey bars. To be hoodwinked by such a farce. Hmm. <laughs> Disappointing. I beg your pardon, Lord Van Zeeks. This is nothing but a smoke screen. A nippity specialty, it would seem. What are you trying to say? My learned friend has persisted with the same line of reasoning from the very beginning. That this witness's intent, intent, intent was to steal an article belonging to Mr. McGilded from the pawnbroker. Yet common sense tells us that none of the articles have value enough to be worth stealing in the first place. Exactly. It would be beyond absurd to break into a place for the purpose of, of stealing such commonplace property. Hmm. Oh, look at that. About to get fucking white boy wasted. If your lordship recalls, Mr. McGilded perished two months ago, immediately after the conclusion of his trial. A trial in which he was found not guilty. A trial in which it was established he was the upstanding member of society, his reputation implied, in fact. So I propose a toast to my learned friend and his most insightful defense. Gah! The articles this upstanding member of society pawned were entirely ordinary. A black overcoat that just happened to have a music box disc in one of its pockets and a small box. I assure you, I wouldn't accept even if the man tried to make a gift of such things to me. You know, that does make rather a lot of sense. It's not as if it was gold or jewels, is it? But goodness knows, this girl that was rich enough there. But you can't deposit the cash in a pawnbroker, I'm quite certain of that. Hmm, curious indeed. The prosecution of the argument is undeniably compelling. It is incumbent on the defense now to bolster its argument. To explain what possible significance these commonplace articles pawned by this fine citizen could have had. Gah. Well, Council, your argument, in fact, demonstrable. demonstrable. Well, now, we'll see. I feel like, uh, now, knowing, knowing what I know now, it seems Van Zykes is trying to get me to uh, incriminate myself a little bit. And Gina, for that fact, but... Are you able to show proof that this disc, or the box, or at any time to put a relay, but in a way, related to this case? Well, um... What's the matter, Reuno? We know that they're related, don't we? They're most vital pieces of evidence. Yes, of course. You and I both know that. <laughs> we know McGilded's true character. And we know the disc is significant, even if we don't know why. But if we explain all that to the court at this point, we'll have to acknowledge that McGilded's acquittal two months ago was a mistake. That the defense's argument was flawed. 
based, even, on false information. Oh, no! And that would mean admitting that Gina committed perjury. But Jenny! Could it be that Van Zeke's nose? Is that why he's doing this now? Because he anticipated everything? But maybe... This could be a great opportunity for us. Sorry, um, what do you mean, uh, Iris? Well, what is it they always say, Bruno? Sooner or later, the truth comes out. Every time. He's right. All right. The exact significance of the things that Gilda deposited with Mr. Wonderbank is something that only Gina can explain to the court. But if I put her on the stand to testify about that, it could critically damage our chances of winning this case. Slap your fucking face, you little bitch. Oh, okay, he's not doing it. What's the right thing to do here? Well, I mean, if it were me, I... Well, if, if, again, if this were me, I would, like, I would leave it, because, uh, again, it does make you look worse for it. And again, like, this is just... You couldn't we just say this is a bluff on Van Zeke's part? Be like, yo, bitch, you're just trying to stall for time until the box gets here. Like, again, if it were me, that's what I would do. And I'd be like, why don't we wait until we, the fucking box comes in, and we look at the box, and we see how relevant it is to the case, you know? That's what I would probably go for, but... You know, we're, we're, we're good, well, we know skate anyway, is a good pure boy, so, you know, we have to bring the truth to light eventually. Even if it is a truth that, uh, you know, makes us look kind of bad. So yeah, Tina, fucking come out. Squeal. Snitch. I know what they say about snitches getting stitches, but I'm going to have to ask you to fucking snitch like a dog. My lord, the defense would like to make a proposal. Oh? What proposal, counsel? Counsel, rebel, rebel. While the court awaits the arrival of Mr. McGill's small box, I would like to call the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade, to the witness stand. The defendant? To what end? It's to deal with the various articles deposited at Winterbanks by Mr. McGilded, my lord. Miss Lestrade has information relating to them. I believe it would be beneficial for the court to hear what she has to say. It will prove the significance of the articles in question once and for all. Well, well. <laughs> Things are becoming interesting indeed. I presume you've considered the implications of the testimony that you're proposing. In particular, the impact it will have on the accused's standing. And indeed your own. I have Lord Van Zykes. Would you care to explain that last remark? The prosecution accepts the defense's proposal. I move to interrupt the cross-examination of the current witnesses and hear from the accuser herself. Yeah, very well, if you have no objection. So, the court will now hear the testimony of the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade. You witnesses currently in the stand may step down until further notice. Then, I shall bid you good day. Wait. You, sir, shall remain in the stand while Miss Lestrade testifies. Mm. As you wish, of course. All right then, Gina. It's time. I know this will be hard, but please, put your faith in me here. Good luck, Runo. Runo. Hi, Gina. How, how's it going? How's the family? Oh, wait, you don't got a family. I'm sorry. The articles that Mr. McGillan had deposited in Windebank's pawnbrokery are intimately related with the Omnibus case, the trial of which was heard in the courtroom two months ago. Yes, and I remember this young lady being brought before me in that trial as well. Bah, bah. That's right, my lord. Her testimony helped to establish the innocence of the defendant, Mr. McGilded. The omnibus case was intriguing, to say the least. 
And now, here we all are again. The same players in that trial, facing each other once more. Well, except for McGilded. He's not with us anymore, sadly. A twist of fate, perhaps, my Nipponese friend. Allow me to recap the events of two months ago. An old brickmaker was stabbed to death in an omnibus running alongside Little London's winter streets. Yep, that was Spice Fired Mason with his dumb hat and also uh, dead. Apart from the victim, there was only one other person in the carriage, Mr. McGilded. Naturally, he was the prime suspect for the murder. But, as the trial progressed, another possibility emerged. That the murder, in fact, place above the defendant's head on the roof deck. The body then being dropped to the skylight into the carriage below. It was Miss Lestrade whose testimony brought that possibility to light. At the time of the incident, Miss Lestrade was concealed under a seat in the carriage, hoping to pick the pockets of unsuspecting passengers. Then, immediately after the trial, having been acquitted of the murder, Mr. McGilded died in this very courtroom, in the most extraordinary circumstances. In fact, you know you're very well aware of that, Judge, and Van Zykes. You watched him die, and did nothing. So frankly, you might be partially culpable in his murder. Just, just throwing it out there. A mystery that remains unsolved even now, two months on. As indeed does the obvious murder itself. Neither has it may. I recall neither the disc nor this small box being mentioned in the course of these proceedings. Of those proceedings, rather. Mr. Strade. Would you tell the court now, please? What really happened in the omnibus two months ago, I mean? I don't know what you mean. I already said all what I know. Come on, Tina, really? You're gonna pull this shit again? Come on. And what about everything you told us yesterday from inside your prison cell? Gah! Please, Mr. Strade. This is extremely important. Besides, like, didn't we have a whole scene? Uh, like, multiple scenes? Where, you, like, you realized that I put your full- You put your full trust in me, and I put my full trust in you? Trust? It's a fucking two-way street, Gina? C can you fucking, like, play along? Jeez. But, but... Remember, little girl. <laughs> if it transpires that you willfully withheld information in the trial two months ago, the Home Office will seek to prosecute you for perjury. Gah! And naturally, you lose all credibility as a witness. Although, let's face facts. You have little credibility to lose. Jenny! Don't listen to him! Remember the heartfelt scenes that we had together? Please! You have to trust Bruno now! Oi! Oi, Iris! We're on your side! Alright then. I'll talk. It's the right choice, Gina. Okay, thankfully, okay, that was, thankfully we didn't have to like pull pull it out of her that much. It would have been annoying if it was like a whole other like twenty minutes of her being like, "No, I, I'm not cooperating with you, fucker." Well, it would seem that my learned friend is hell bent on bringing the entire courtroom down about his ears. So be it. I must confess that I'm struggling to understand what on earth is happening here. However, it would appear that Mr. McGill's pond articles and this extraordinary case of the omnibus have a secret of which we have been hitherto unaware. Yeah, so it would seem. So it would seem. So, Mr. Strad, you will now give your testimony before the court about the events of two months ago. You will reveal the truth. A commodity that's so lacking in your little statements. This is it then. Everything's going to come out. Like Van Zeke said. This could bring the whole courtroom down about my ears. But as a lawyer, I'm prepared to take that risk.
the real truth of the omnibus case. And truth is, that brickmaker cove was in the cabin of the omnibus the whole time. When the Irishman, when the Irishman dragged me up from under the seat, I saw that disc on the floor. All of a sudden, I heard a scrape roll over my head, and that pair on the roof deck went off to call the slops. That's when uh, McGill did uh, slip the driver some ten to do a run to the pawn shop roundabout. <sighs> he threatened me not to snitch, not to say nothing to no one about what I'd seen at home. Yeah, that's about that's about the long and short of what you told us yesterday. Good grief! This is outrageous! What you've just told the court bears almost no resemblance to your testimony two months ago. As you say, my lord. Then, then, there's every chance. I may have advocated an error in McGilded's trial. It sounds very much to me as if this man deliberately deceived this court in effort to cover up the most, most wicked of schemes. Uh, without doubt, your lordship is correct. A great injustice was done in this courtroom two months ago. The actions of the accused in that trial, of this witness, and of my learned friend are entirely inexcusable. I don't believe it. The whole trial was a farce. It was all lies. That McGillan fellow was brought into the court. Just like that pickpocket. Don't forget that lawyer from the East. They were all in order together. You're wrong, the lot of you. Mr. Nero Odo, that lawyer there, he didn't know nothing about it. Humbug. I don't think so. Are you really expected to believe that? He, he really stepped everyone up, didn't he? What an operation to get the man off scot free. Unforgivable. Stop. The lights have to stop. Stop. I guess. Yes, the defense made a terrible error of judgment. You might even say it was a bruh moment, okay? Maybe even I was being a little quirky. And McGilder was definitely being quirky, but come on. It was just a prank, okay? Did you ever consider that? I intend to take full responsibility and suffer whatever consequences are deemed appropriate. However, it's imperative that the court allows the witness to elaborate on a testimony. Because the true significance of McGilded's pond articles must be brought to light. Mm, very well, <laughs> my learned student friend. Given the depths of calamity you've just plunged yourself into, this may well be worth hearing. <laughs> Words fail me. This situation is utterly deplorable. Mr. Narahodo! Uh, yes, my lord. Don't, please don't hurt me. I'm just a little boy. Don't tease me. I will decide upon your fate following the conclusion of this trial. Of course, my lord. Uh, blimey. Mr. Narahodo! Now, Ransom, proceed with the cross-examination. The real truth of the Omnibus case. Hmm. Oh, okay, first off, let me do what I did last time. Uh, because, frankly, there's something about that guy to, to the right that is, uh, has me wondering. Hold it! And you were hiding in the cabin at the time as well, weren't you, Mr. Strait? If I remember rightly, in the storage compartment underneath one of the seats, yeah, that's right. It's pitch black under there, so you, you can't can't see nothing at all. Okay, cool, but also... I'm sorry, what the fuck are you guys up to? You got something you want to share with the rest of the class? Tobias? Mr. Graydon? Motherfucker? Excuse me! Is there something you'd like to share with the court, Inspector Gregson and Mr. Graydon? Whisper, whisper, whisper. Inspector! Mr. Graydon! Uh, what the fuck? Uh, blimey! You're trying to give me a heart attack? You've been whispering to each other for quite some time. Tell us, what is the discussion about? Uh, discussion? Uh, with this fella? I uh, brought the other one, Sunshine. You think I've got anything to talk about with a shady jit like this? 
and I have nothing to say to this uncouth detective after he deprived me of that disc that was rightfully mine. But they've clearly been talking the entire time. I've been cross-examining Gina. How the fuck are you just gonna like be like, uh, no, we weren't talking when everyone in the fucking courtroom saw you guys were whispering to each other? You can't just deny that shit. What the fuck? It's as if they've been negotiating. You will kindly refrain from talking amongst, you, amongst yourselves while the witness is giving testimony. Uh, yes, um, uh, sorry, my lord. What were those two talking about? Mrs. Raid, continue with our testimony, please. Okay, well, this is where I had left off last time, before, uh, during the episode where I didn't have any audio because I'm a dum dum. So, uh, I think I will do that, I will leave off here, just to be consistent, you know, and not go beyond what I've already d done so far. Again, I feel like a real dummy, but, you know, nothing for it, I suppose. Anyway, my, my, my main takeaways are, one, we're probably going to be in some poo-poo after this case is over, thanks to uh, the truth coming out about the Omnibus case. But also, fucking Gregson is acting, like, really sus, for, like, no good reason. Or at least, I mean, there might be a reason, but... I don't know it yet, and it's like, come on, man, there's like been multiple moments throughout this case where Gregson's behavior was quite suspicious, you know? That seems to be my main takeaway for right now. So I'm not actually sure what we're going to be figuring out. I guess there's going to be any more information from Gina, because like, I assume she's not lying anymore, right? You would hope. But anyway, uh, next episode we will get into the testimony proper. But until then, I will see you around, and, you know. I'll remember to make sure my mic isn't muted.